Okay, so this is all about the cosmetics of it. It's making the door, the final wiring up, and then the cosmetics of the build. Because the outer case is going to change, really, depending on what you can find, what it is you want to use, what tools you've got available to you, a whole host of things. Now, I've tried to make this with the minimum tool set required, so I've used hardly any tools to actually make it. It shouldn't be a um, stop to you if you don't have a CNC lathe machine or anything. That shouldn't stop you trying to do stuff because you can do the most amazing things with just the barest minimum of tools, a bit of creativity and good use of what you find around you. That sounds like a rumble. <laughs> anyway, all we've done with this is um, from that original one, if you cast back on the previous video, we made the frame and put the bricks in. All I've done is I've put a base on it and then a face on there. Now, I was going to make this out of a bit of stainless steel, but I came across a load of these. These are perforated shelves from uh, a server unit, I think. And they're a nice good bit of grey chunky steel with lovely perforations in and I couldn't resist. So I changed the design. And that's what you can do when you're doing this stuff. So I cut out this centre section here so I could get in there. They used one whole piece here as the stand for it to be on. And personally, I think it looks really cute, which is why I did it. I, I like the look of it. And the next thing that I did was make the door. And to be honest, it's a piece of cake. There's the door. You can see what it is. It's really just two bits of angle iron here and here, two bits there held together with bolts. And then I stuffed the bricks into it. And of course I sealed the bricks with that silicate sealant that we used on everything else and cut out a plug so that that plug here will fit into that opening. There's about a um, two centimeter depth to it. So when it closes, it'll close in there. And I made these bits a bit longer because I put some 10 mil threaded bar here, a couple of cap nuts on it and a bit of plastic. That's my handle. And I did the same thing here, but I made the bar longer and this is copper pipe and that's my hinge. There's a bit of angle here with the bolt in it because this fits by dropping in a 10 mil hole I've drilled in the base, just like that. That angle goes into there and that makes the hinge of our door. So now if we put a bolt on there, <coughs> there we go. We have really quite a nice door that works really well. Now, I'm not too bothered, uh, I'll tighten that up again in a minute, I'm not too bothered about things like latches and, um, for a kiln this size, a cut-off switch. I just think it's completely unnecessary. None of the other kilns I've ever bought or owned or have at this moment, at this size, have an emergency cut-off switch. They're usually here on the door. They're a little angle that press a normally open switch. So unless the door is closed, it won't turn on. Now you can add that if you want. You just put an angle onto your door there, put your uh, little contact switch there, when the door closes, pushes that switch and then it'll turn on. I'm not gonna bother. If you're that worried about it, put a safety switch on there. The other thing you could do is put a clasp on there and that's really easy. Just get yourself a bolt, stick a nut on it and then swivel it round and tighten it down. It'll keep the door shut. Again, I'm not too bothered by that because it, it's got enough weight and mass to keep that door shut all by itself. So that's the door finished and attached. It's part of the um, facing finished and attached. All we've got to do is wrap this in the um, ceramic fibre blanket, finish the wiring, and then it's actually ready to go. So that's what we're going to do next, is we're gonna do that wrap. Now, a word about this ceramic fibre blanket. It isn't nice stuff. And if you're working with it all day long, every day, you really need to take precautions with it. If you're doing a job like this, where you're going to use it once, then you need to be sensible with it for sure, but you don't need to worry that you're going to die of silicosis tomorrow. Do sensible stuff like pull down your sleeves. You pull down your sleeves so the fibres can't get into your skin. Now I have refitted roofs with glass fibre and got glass fibre into my arms, and it does itch for a few days like crazy. So it just makes sense, pull down your sleeves, put some gloves on and wear a mask and you're just going to be Jim Dandy. You do not need to worry about dropping dead from hideous lung diseases. If you're working with it all day long every day, 
sure, you need some real good gear to take care of you. When you're doing something like this, just be sensible and you're going to be okay. So we need to wrap this with the fibre blanket and then fasten that down with some stainless steel wire. So we wrap it, put a loop of wire around, twist it and then make the coverings. And that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so what we've done is give it a couple of layers of blanket. It's one inch blanket, so there's an extra two inches of insulation there. We're taking some of this, which is just stainless steel wire, feed it through, pull it tight, give it a couple of twists, and there's three of those. Now, I have seen this with aluminium foil on top of that, but I don't know whether it does anything or not, so I decided to leave the aluminium foil out. If you want to put the aluminium foil in, well, knock yourself out. Now, once we get the cap on this, you're not going to disturb it, so it really... Stop worrying about it if you are. Um, if you go sticking your nose in and breathing it deeply while poking it with a pencil, you probably shouldn't. But um, once we get the caps on, it's really nothing to worry about. But there's the extra insulation. Obviously, we've done it all the way around. The back's still open. I just tightened up that door so that it does a really nice job. And now all we need to do is make the covers out of this. And I'm going to cut them from this stuff and then finish the wiring up. And we're ready to go. Okay, and that is the construction finished. And it's quite pretty, even if I say so myself. I, I like this. I like the sort of look of it. So all we've really got to do now is uh, wire it in. So we've done the coils, we've done the basic structure, we've finished this off. And remember, this is going to look different to the one you make, uh, because I was just lucky to find these shelving uh, pieces that I used for this. But all the basics is there. And the only thing we need to do now is actually wire it up and um, fire it up and get something going with it. OK, so here's the back of it. Now, I don't like things crowded in there, so there's going to be nothing in here. There'll be a plate over the top. And the only thing that I need to put in now is this thing, which is the thermocouple. So that measures the temperature. And I've drilled a hole as near to the middle as I can get it and right at the top of the kiln. And the thermocouple just slides in there. So I've made a little bracket so that we can bolt that thermocouple down and screw it onto this piece of steel so it's nice and fixed. And here we've got a um, rubber inlet so that the wire will come in here and the thermocouple will go out of here. We'll strap everything down and we're going to wire that up just as we talked about on the wiring video. OK, that's it wired. Nice and uncomplicated, exactly how it should be, because this is the bit that's going to need maintenance and one thing you don't want is to cram stuff in there so you can't get to it. So basically, leave lots of room. It makes everything really that much easier, that much safer, and you are going to be repairing this at some time, so it's good idea to do it. And you can see I've wired it up to a, la a neutral to one end of the coil, and that neutral goes to the neutral supply. It goes up and down the coil, comes out here, is joined to this coil in series, comes down here, and then goes to that live. That live does not go to the supply. That goes to the switch. So that's actually a switched live, and we switch that using the solid-state relay. And you'll notice I've earthed the um, case as well, because it's a big metal case. Uh, and we've got some open wires in there. So I've got an earth on there. And the thermocouple is just tidied away with little stainless steel wire ties to keep everything from sagging or dropping or touching. And then it comes out of this sealed exit. And this sealed exit is uh, IP65, I think. And so you can give that a good tug and nothing's actually moving. So it's nice and firm. These wires will go to the actual control box where all the controls are. But that is how you wire the back of the kill knob. OK, the wiring really is simple. Now we've got everything in here, we don't have to worry about it particularly and try and cram things in there. Now if it's a big kiln, like in my big kiln there's lots of space, then sure, I'll put the stuff in the back there. But a little thing like this, we start cramming things in, then there's a chance they'll touch, they're a pain in the neck to repair when you actually have to repair them. So I like to, I like to keep everything away, nice and neat and tidy, plenty of room and away from things. That's just my choice. You find people bolting on boxes onto the side, you find them doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, and me, I like it out of the way so that I can get to it when the inevitable happens. But it's really pretty simple stuff because you're just dealing with two bits of equipment. This one has a picture on telling you what to do, and I'll give you a close-up of that in a second. And this one has a picture on it telling you what to do. So let's have a close-up of that. OK, so you only really need essentially two bits. You can put a switch in there if you want, or you can just rely on the switch on the socket. I quite often put a switch in, and I usually put a double-pole switch that switches the live and the neutral. And now, it's dead easy, 
there are just two sides to it. The neutral comes in to one side and it goes out of the other side. And then when you turn that switch, the neutral will be switched. Same thing with the live, but it's on the opposite side. Now, if we have a look at this PID controller, then there are a number of little terminals on the back there. And then on the side, there is invariably a picture. If there isn't, it'll have come with the sheet. If it hasn't come with the sheet, you just look it up and the uh, information is abundant. There's lots of it, really. Now, here we've got one and two, which tell you that it is the AC in. So it doesn't matter which way around you do this, but I usually put the live into one and the neutral into two. Now it does need a supply, so you, it's not a switch. So live and neutral into one and two. You can set alarms and the alarm function here on six and seven. I never do, to be honest. You can attach different kinds of relays where you have different timing sequences. Again, I never bother. So three it never gets used. Four and five are the ones that you use. And there's a little symbol telling you that four is plus and five is minus. Then if we come to this side here, we've got eight, nine and ten. Eight, nine and ten are in fact where the um, thermocouple goes. It's the sensor. Now you don't connect 8 which is an alarm it's 9 and 10 that you connect and again again it tells you which one is plus and which one is minus there's a little plus sign by 10 a little minus sign by 8 and if you have a look at the end of a thermocouple and there's one there it's got blue and red to help you so that's the plus that's the minus so there you go Let's check that's the right way around in there and you just screw those down and you're done that's it for the thermocouple. Here is where your comes from the switch into here. So from the double pole switch live goes in there, double pole switch neutral goes in there, and you're done. It's as simple as that, it really is. From here, we run two wires to this. This is the actual relay. Again, it's just another switch. And it tells you that three and four are plus and minus. So we connect where it says SSR minus to minus and SSR plus to plus. And that's all you do with that. Now on this one, this is where the live gets switched. So this is live in and live out, and it doesn't matter which way around it goes. So from the double pole switch, you pull another live that comes in here. Then this one goes straight down this white wire that we connected up and that live is the one that goes to the live coil. So remember we've got a live, a neutral and an earth. The earth just gets connected to the earth in. The neutral gets connected to the neutral double pole switch on the switch side. This live goes in here and then the other live goes in there. And that is all there is to it. So this is what it looks like when it's all connected up. There's the double pole switch, there's the relay, there's the PID controller, and there's the thermocouple. Once you get that all connected, it looks just like that. It's a jumble of wires when you get it together, but if you think clearly about what it is you're doing, it's a piece of cake to do that. Okay, that's everything wired together. The whole thing's finished and it's now ready to go. So the next thing to do, obviously, is fire it up. And we're going to do that in a different video because we're going to use this to make some graphitic carbon nitride. But anyway, there we go. Start to finish how to mill your own lab kiln, how to repair other kilns, how to wire them, and how to make coils. That's a lot of information. So I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope you do find it useful. And thank you very much.